right. Halfway through the week. Almost. Right? Lunchtime is halfway point. What I think. Just a reminder, uh, I do drop off my child in the morning. Uh, so if I'm here just a little bit late, stick around. I'll be here. Uh, if I know I'm not going to be here, if I'm not feeling good or, or something like that, I'll put out an announcement on Blackboard uh, and probably get that out 7, 7.30. So hopefully uh, you're not driving here. What do we have to do? Try beta meeting today. Eight o'clock in here. Uh, no lab this week. Hopefully, no one showed up for the lab yesterday. Uh, we do have lab next week, so make sure you <clears throat> review the material that, that we covered last week. Right? Pay attention to the boxes, p values, interpretations. Know what our null hypothesis is. Know what to do with it when we have various levels of p value. And then also read through the handout for, for this next week. This next week will take most of the time. Bring your calculus. Bring your calculus. All right. Any questions? All right, this is where we left off. So we've been talking about evolution, evolution and adaptation. Up to this point, you've probably learned or been told uh, that evolution always picks the best adaptation, or at least that's kind of maybe the assumption when, when it's taught, that evolution always get, is going to pick the best adaptation. And the best, in the sense, and things are considered best only under certain contexts. All right? Sometimes it's not the best adaptation. And the question is, why not? Why wouldn't it be the best adaptation? In some cases, our version of best is wrong. What we assume to be the best adaptation might not actually be. Right? But in other cases, these, these three situations explain why we might not have that best adaptation. So we left off with the contraptions. Evolution is going to work on variation that already exists. And a lot of those adaptations are things that existed in our organism as it was evolving. So the panda's thumb represents a good example because it's not actually a thumb. It's a modification of their radial sesamoid bone. All right? As that projection enlarged, it's better able to strip off those leaves and acquire food. Yes. All right. Second explanation as to why we don't have that best adaptation, is that evolution is a continuous process. All right? we, don't, we can't think of it as just a one-time event. It's always occurring. So perhaps we're not getting the best adaptation or our version of best because we're not quite there yet. It's, we're getting there. Maybe it's going to take 10 years. Maybe it's going to take another 1,000 years. It's just we're on our way to get there. And the other thing to consider, recognizing that this is a continuous process, is that if the environment changes, so do the selection pressures. So what is best today might actually be the worst thing tomorrow. And this introduces uh, this Red Queen hypothesis. All right, the Red Queen hypothesis was named uh, after Alice through the looking glass. All right. Now, I, I remember the cartoon version quite well. There's some newer versions out there. Right, but in the cartoon version, Alice is being chased by the Red Queen, and she just keeps running and running and running, and the Red Queen's always there, never out running. And perhaps some of you have had dreams like that, right? Keep running and boogeyman's behind you all the time. That's the Red Queen hypothesis. 
saying that the environment is changing faster than adaptations can arise by natural selection. So evolution is going, doing its thing. Natural selection is doing its thing. But every time we start getting ahead, the environment changes and puts us back again, puts us a step back. A classic example of this Red Queen hypothesis in action is host parasite systems. The host is always trying to develop a way to eliminate that parasite inside their body, or perhaps on their body. The parasite is always trying to find ways to evade the host immune system, evade the host defenses. As our body develops a way to eliminate that parasite, the parasite's going to evolve a way to get around it. And it's just an endless circle, endless circle. Neither of them get gets ahead of the other. We're just in a constant evolutionary race. So the implications of this Red Queen hypothesis is that individuals have to constantly evolve just to, in theory, stay in the same place of fitness, just to survive. All right, so just remember, evolution's in a constant process. Maybe we're not there yet, or maybe the environment changed and now evolution's taking us down a slightly different path. Questions on the Red Queen hypothesis? Our last explanation as to why imperfections exist, that there are constraints on evolution. The laws of physics must be followed. We can't break them. No matter how cool I think it would be to have wings and fly around all the place, physics doesn't allow that. All right, in order to do this, we have to have just massive pectoral muscles that well exceed the size of our body. Can't do that. Okay? Just not possible. So we might have a vision of the best adaptation, but if that breaks the laws of physics, it's not going to happen. We could talk about birth weights, right? That was an example of stabilizing selection, right? Being larger is a good thing, but laws of physics prevent us from getting a large head through a small birth canal. Can't do it. Can't break those laws of physics. So the main take-home point of all of this is that selection isn't the end-all, be-all solution. We may have presented it years ago or in other classes, as the, you know, the, the best response to a problem, but it's not. Right? It's not. Imperfections exist out in nature, and they exist for a reason. Questions? So, dual right, try to address that, that idea that imperfections exist. And he was trying to think of a way where we have adaptations that exist in various populations, various subpopulations. And you've got this one population that's doing real well, has the adaptations required to succeed. But then you have this other subpopulation that doesn't, doesn't have that adaptation. They're surviving, they're doing okay. But Sewell Wright is thinking about this idea of how do we take this population with imperfect adaptations and get them to this other point. Over time, it hasn't happened. So he started trying to envision fitnesses for all of those adaptations in between. And this led him to develop this idea of an adaptive landscape, which is a graphical representation of fitness associated with different phenotypes. Now I have it here in two different ways. I have it as a two-dimensional figure, and I have it as a three-dimensional graph. And what this is looking at is basically saying we have a range of phenotypes. And now again, you can think of phenotypes as more of a quantitative trait, a range of phenotypes. It's not just like red, red hair, blonde hair, brown hair, black hair, and so forth. Think of it as height. 
arm lengths, finger lengths, maybe muscle mass, or something like that. It's on, a, it's on more of a continuous measurement type scale. And some phenotypes, we have peak fitness. So the higher we are on the graph, the higher the fitness. All right, some locations we have peaks, other locations we have valleys. On this fitness landscape, or this adaptive landscape, we would say that if we're down here in a valley, if our phenotype is down here in this valley, it's not going to do as well as individuals that have a phenotype that's at the peak. All right, so selection then would favor those individuals that are at the peak. And the same thing applies to a three-dimensional graph. Now, instead of just one phenotype, now we have two phenotypes that we, can that we can deal with. And we've got the combination of all of these. But we still have peaks, and we still have valleys. Now, selection is always going to increase fitness. So if we have a population, we have an average phenotype that is right here. So this is our average phenotype in our population. Selection is always going to increase. Now you could say, well, if all individuals are at this phenotype, how does it go up? Well, remember, I just said the average phenotype value. So our population is going to be spread. It's going to look probably more like a bell curve. So you've got the average at this point, but you have some individuals with the higher phenotypes, some individuals with the larger phenotypes. So selection is going to favor those individuals with that larger phenotype, and gradually our average phenotype value will increase up to the peak. If we start over here, same idea. Selection is going to cause a shift, always pushing us up to that fitness peak. If we're here, selection is always going to cause us to go up to increase our fitness, and we'll end up here. And the same applies on a three-dimensional landscape. Sewell Wright was asking this question. Well, if we're at A, how do we get to B? How do we get to that peak? Could selection do it? Why not? Did you shake your head? Yeah. Why not? Could selection get us to B? Get us from A to B? We have a yes. I'm waiting on anybody at home to volunteer. Could selection get us from A to, A to B? So is it because the environment changes faster than adaptations can occur? Hold that thought. We're going to assume that our landscape is static. And it's static for as long as we need it to be static. We'll address that. We'll address that. Our explanation is actually on this slide. Ha. Ah, exactly. So selection always increases fitness. If we're at A, even if we have variation in our environment, even if we have, let's say, a bell curve that spans this region here. Let's see if I could get, uh, let's see if I could do this. Normal. That's big. Let's say our population has a phenotype that range is between this, and our population average is at the peak. You'd say, you might think, well, we're going to select for this side because this side is closer to B. But if you do that, what happens to our population fitness? It goes down. Can selection do that? No, not at all. Selection always causes an increase in fitness. That's our rule. That's our rule. So could selection take us from A to B? No, it can't. At least not alone. So this is where Sewell Wright came up with 
his explanation for jumping peaks, which is shifting balance theory. All right, this shifting balance theory says, and I quote it, it's a shifting balance of subpopulations across a fitness landscape. Now, what does that mean? A shifting balance of small subpopulations. Well, it means we're going to have our population, it's going to be subdivided in some way, and our small populations are free to move around through processes other than selection. And eventually, one of those will get to our new peak, or at least the slope of the new peak, and selection can then now start taking us up and moving our population. Now, that's kind of a quick description of it. The shifting balance theory is right proposed it, actually exists in three different phases. Phase one is local differentiation and loss of fitness. Phase two is fitness recovery. And then phase three is spread of our optimum phenotype. All right, and I put up the requirements on this slide because what we're going to do, the next slides go over each of these. So as you, you can see, I, I'm gonna, we're going to kind of go through each of these. So I'll give you time to get this on. And then what we're going to do is hit each, each phase and explain exactly what's happening, including the requirements. Let me know when, when you, you've got it. Got it? What's that? We're going to go over the requirements. You can get them down here and then have, you know, phase one, local differentiation, lots of things. We're, we're going to explain each one in a little bit more detail. And I have some, some diagrams. And again, the diagrams are posted on the handout, so you can, you can print them, you can have them, um, however you, you want to organize your notes and, and so forth. Hopefully the note apps have the ability to insert PDFs. All right, ready? All right, so shifting balance theory. This is being proposed by Wright as a way to move our population from a suboptimal peak to the optimal peak, all right? And we have to traver traverse that fitness valley in order to do it. So phase one is local differentiation and loss of fitness. We're going to need our population to lose fitness. Selection can't do it. Right? Selection always pushes us up, always increases our fitness. But we know one mechanism of evolution can lower our fitness, and that's genetic drift. All right, that's genetic drift. Now, genetic drift isn't very, isn't very efficient when looking at a large population. So Sewell Wright looked at populations and said, well, how do they exist out in nature? How do populations exist? And he sees that our populations seem to form groups. Right? They tend to be subdivided. Maybe it's they're subdivided around uh, habitat quality. Maybe they're subdivided because of social structure. But you go out into a savanna and you can see maybe several subpopulations out there. In his mind, he's thinking these, sub -small, these small subpopulations are going to experience drift. Yeah, they're part of the larger population as a whole, but our evolution is going to be acting on these small subpopulations. 
All right, so small subpopulation, that's their small effective population size. They're going to drift around our landscape. Now, if our forces of drift exceed the forces of selection, then we're going to get this random movement around our landscape. So each of these different colors represents a different subpopulation. All right, so you're going to get this random movement. Some of the times drift takes us down the slope. Sometimes drift takes us back up a slope. Sometimes drift takes us right to a valley. Sometimes drift will ultimately take us to a newer peak. All right, and that's what we want. We want some of these small populations to move around our landscape with the hope that we can get to a slope of a peak that is higher than where we are currently at. All right, so why are, why are these small populations required? Why do we need to be fragmented in subpopulations? What did we just say? Yeah, because drift is stronger at small populations. So we're going to evoke genetic drift to help us get there. All right? So that's definitely a benefit. It allows us to get to move down a peak. What's the cost of a small population size? We haven't really talked about this yet, but you may have encountered it in another class. What's the downside of a small population? What's that? Yeah, less genetic variation. You can have bad things happen just due to genetic drift, all right? Random chance events. All right, so small population, forces of drift exceed the forces of selection. We're hoping that one of these subpopulations get to one of these new slopes of a higher fitness peak. Once they get there, we're hoping, or at least Wright's hoping, then that the forces of selection start to take over and start to override the forces of drift. Now you could say, well, hold on, we're still a small sub subpopulation, wouldn't drift still be in effect? And I'd say, yes, it is. But the idea is that when we get to this new peak, that adaptation on that slope is going to be better than the original adaptations that they have, and you're going to start to get a larger population size in that subpopulation. You're basically doing better. All right, so as your population sizes start to increase, that subpopulation size starts to increase, now drift can take over. Once drift starts taking over, it's going to move that subpopulation all the way up to that fitness peak. It's not all of our population yet. It's just a subpopulation. So you've got a subpopulation here, makes it to this peak, you get a subpopulation here, makes it to that peak. Right. We're at two different peaks. Do these peaks have to be higher than this peak? No. Could this peak be the largest peak? Yeah, it could maybe. Maybe. We'd have to look at it. But the idea is that we've moved from one peak, we're now at another peak. And that brings up our last phase, which is the spread those high, highly fit traits to the rest of the population at large. All right, so our subpopulations at the new peak, we need to get those genes out to the rest of the subpopulations. And this is spread. Now we're going to invoke gene flow. So migrants, immigrants from our population will go out, introduce that highly fit adaptation or adaptations to the rest of the subpopulations. And when you do so, you've basically just caused the entire population average to start shifting over to that peak. We're still existing as subpopulations, but now all of the subpopulations are slowly being pulled to that new peak, all through gene flow. Yeah. Give you. 
little bit more time. So this idea, the shifting balance theory, now is providing some mechanism where we can go from a suboptimal peak to an optimal peak. Okay. Selection helps us get there, but we rely on genetic drift, genetic drift specifically to cause a decrease in fitness. We're relying on selection to move us back up a new peak, and then we're relying on gene flow to distribute that new adaptation to the rest of the subpopulations, to the population as a whole. All right? And in this way now, we have a way in which we can produce more fit adaptations, despite all of the different peaks and valleys across our landscape. All right? So this just kind of wraps up the summary here. It's kind of, this is what shifting balance does. And hopefully you see that this is basically the same material that we've already, that's been on the previous slides. Yeah, then it's quiz. those of you that are here, at least one of our answers will be norm. So I know it's, it's often at the live stream, norm, N-O-R-M, write it down. I did that so that somebody doesn't come in at the end and see the, see the answers on the board. Thought about that. It's a way to get around sitting through an 8 a.m. That's at least one of our answers. You can write it down. I'll give you the other one in a little bit. All right. Questions on shifting balance theory? All right. Now, arguments against. This was 1931. Sewell Wright proposed this. Wrote an article about it. At the same time, we have this other guy, Sir Ronald Fisher, mathematician, biologist, population geneticist, theoretical evolutionary biologist, did a lot of stuff. You've probably heard of him before. I know my, my stat students did. This guy came up with ANOVA, analysis of areas, Fisher's, Fisher's exact test, the F test. After Sewell Wright published, Fisher wrote a rebuttal. And then, after his paper, Sewell Wright responded with another paper, and then Fisher responded. About four or five papers over the span of 20 years, maybe, dealing with shifting balance theory. Is it, is it accurate? Is it, can it happen? Wright says yes. Fisher says no. And then hopefully, we can kind of come up with, with an intermediate answer to that. So Fisher really was arguing against shifting balance theory for two main reasons. One, he felt the populations are too large to be affected by genetic drift. And two, he assumed that the fitness landscape changes faster than our populations, which is what Logan was saying. I guess you're in the Fisher camp then. All right. So, point number one populations are too large to be affected by genetic drift. Fisher assumes a homogeneous population, assumes that our populations really aren't broken apart or fragmented in any ways due to the environment, assumes that you don't really have the social structure, or even if you do have this fragmentation or social structure, you have too much movement between the subpopulations for any of these individual subpopulations to go down their own evolutionary path. All right, so he said, just because of this, you can't drift. It's going to have very minimal, very little effect on our phenotype frequencies. Hey, you'll get, you know, bouncing a little bit, but it's not going to be enough to move us off of a fitness peak. Now, again, Fisher's not arguing against 
the adaptive fitness speak. He's arguing against shift, shifting balance theory. Now, it's notable that in one of these later articles, he acknowledges that perhaps this could happen if we're at the edge of a species range. Because now at that point, he thinks maybe we are sufficiently isolated from the rest of the group for drift to actually work and exceed the forces of selection. So, you know, grand scheme of things, he's thinking, no, populations are too large, drift has minimal effect, with the exception of right at the very edge of our ranges where those might be isolated. And if they're isolated, they could be small. The second argument against is that our fitness landscape changes faster than the populations. And this goes back to our properties of fitness. Property, our fitness is determined by the environment. And Fisher says that year to year variation is going to produce different landscapes every year. And if we're dealing with organisms that has, has a generation time of let's say one year, what our parental population sees this year will be different than what our offspring see next year, which is different than what our grand offspring see the year after that. So if every year changes, we're going to have selection acting in different ways. Why? Because our fitness has changed. So Fisher would argue that our landscape isn't really a static topographic map, but rather it's a map that's going to fluctuate, peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. Kind of like you could see some uh, sound visualizations. I don't know if your phone would do it, but you play music and you'll get these things that bounce up and down, right? That's Fisher's idea. That it's, you're going to get this fluctuation. So we're at a peak today, but tomorrow we're in a valley. And then the next day we're on a slope. And eventually what's going to happen is selection takes over and just causes us to have this random walk around the landscape. Again, selection's always pushing us up to a peak, but we're never really in a valley to, for too long to kill us off. So this random walk isn't due to genetic drift, like Sewell Wright would suggest. Rather, the random walk is a random walk because it's selection moving us around towards the new peaks that appear and disappear year after year. Questions? All right. We have no questions. <clears throat> See if we can come up with some real good take home points, real good summaries. All right, so we're talking about adaptations and how they originate, and this isn't going to be the only discussion of, of those things. But the key point with evolution is that not all traits are maximally efficient and or adaptive. Some traits are actually pretty bad for our organism. But if it has other traits that allow it to survive, they'll persist. So why aren't traits maximally efficient and or adaptive? Give me one, one explanation. <laughs> All right, explana explanation number one, the environment is changing, or the environment changes, right? That's evolution is a continuous process, right? Environment change. So our view of what's maximally efficient might be wrong. What else? Physics, we gotta abide by the laws of physics. What else? This guy. This is. Panda's thumb. Adaptations are contractions. They're adap they're modifications of what we currently have. All right? That's what we have to deal with. That's reality. 
Now, if we're suboptimal, how do we become optimal and or more efficient? Okay, selection might take us there if our environment changes, right? If it doesn't, if we're static, what theory proposes how we can get there? Jewel Wright proposed it. What is it? Shifting balance theory. We just went over it. All right, this is kind of a, all of our take-home points. But the questions here, so you can kind of review in your notes and try to answer them. All right? And a key part of all of this is that our evolutionary process is dynamic. Drift, gene flow, mutation, selection, they're all occurring. Even though it might not look like it is, all right? it is, they are. Our populations are dealing with these all the time. Not only that, but our environment's always changing. And if our environment changes, so do our fitnesses, and that changes how selection is going to be acting. So, again, we've just kind of built in that whole contingency part of this class. Okay. Contingency in ecology. We need to know where we start to have a better idea of why we got there. And a lot of times it's very difficult to identify that because of all of the unique variation in our environment. All right. Question. That one? All right, so I have a quiz that gets posted today. After class, uh, I'll get it. I wasn't sure if we were going to get it done or not. So um, I'll get this released. You'll have until the end of the day on Friday to, to do this quiz. Make sure you review. Uh, review the material before you take the quiz. Three attempts at it, highest grade. Um, All right. All right. Next up. <clears throat> Adaptations to the environment. I should make sure that this is the right. Yep. All right. Adaptations to the environment. We're going to talk about how the environment affects growth and survival briefly, hopefully. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. All right. This is uh, handout 3.1, I think. At least that's how I've labeled this, 3.1. All right. Our organisms interact with the environment. Right? That's ecology. That's what we study, the interactions of, of individuals, the interactions of populations with their environment. They interact in two different ways. They interact with the environment because they're, quote, they're trying to uh, acquire a physical resource, or they're interacting because they have to deal with a physical factor. All right, so two different terms. Physical factors and physical resources. Physical factors are the conditions that affect the organism's growth and survival. Right? These are the, this is the abiotic world. The abiotic world as we see it. All right? This isn't something that the organism has to ingest and assimilate and everything. It's just something that the organism has to deal with. So, what's an example of an abiotic factor, or physical factor, I should say? What's that? 
Let's be more specific. So the answer was weather. Let's be more specific about that. We have to be more specific about an earthquake too. Okay, water supply. All right, that's tricky. Add a note with the water supply. What else? Not really nutrients. Not necessarily. That's not a factor. What's that? Uh. Yeah, okay, so the terrain, in a sense, depends on what organism, what type of organism we're dealing with. So, you know, what we're getting at, what we often hear is like pH is one, all right? That, that's abiotic world. That's classic one. Salt, concentration, salinity, that's, that's one. When we talk about these more complex factors, weather has, plays a role. We're dealing with temperature. That's physical factors, all right? With the weather, you can have excess rain or not enough rain, all right? And uh, again, with, with water, we're going to talk about that as, as kind of an, an exception. With terrain, kind of depends on which, maybe which slope we're facing, right? How do we interact with the rest of the abiotic world based on that, that the slope and, and the general uh, geography? Yep, temperatures. All right, so the resources are those, or those things that the organism needs to survive. All right? And this is both the energy and the inorganic materials. So that's why the nutrients is more of a physical resource because nutrients, just by their name, imply that the organism has to acquire them in some way. They need to assimilate. They don't need to assimilate to pH or salinity. They're dealing with those, with the consequences of those two. Water is the one exception. Water is both a physical factor and a physical resource. All right? Our organisms need water to survive. They have to, they have to acquire it. All right? So that's the resource component of it. But organisms have to deal with too much water or too little water. All right? Problem for our terrestrial organisms. They have an issue of drying out. All right? That's a physical factor that they're contending with, usually. But if we talk about dry conditions and how do they acquire that limited water, now we're talking about a resource. So water is just kind of like an interesting, both, it's both a factor and a resource, and it just depends on the context that we're dealing with. But these two things, this is what our organisms interact with, and this is what ends up driving, uh, driving our evolution. All right? So to help explain some of this interaction, Victor Shelfer came up with this idea of the law of tolerance. Right? It's defined as a concept that states that there are upper and lower bounds to the physical factors with which an organism can survive. Now note, it's physical factors, not the resources. We're not talking about the resources. We're just talking about the abiotic world. I like a gnat flying around my face. Right? There are upper and lower bounds to the physical factors within which an organism can survive. The implication of this idea is that organisms can't live everywhere. They're defined by the range of factors that they can tolerate, hence the law of tolerance. If they're outside of that range, they're going to die. If they're inside of that range, they can survive. But Shelford went even further to say that there are certain abiotic conditions where the organism does better than the rest. And this is where he came up with the, this idea of zones. All right. So let's draw this curve. So this is a bell curve. Normal curve. Where on this curve, we have our population size, N, and we have physical factor, the range of physical factors, 
on our x-axis. So say that's salinity, or say it's temperature. We'll say temperature. We got low temperature down here, we have high temperature up here. Our population size along this range might look something like this. Where we cross that x-axis, marks our upper and lower bounds. So anywhere between these two points represents our zone of tolerance. Our organism can tolerate those temperatures between those upper and lower bounds. They can survive. Outside, we have our zone of intolerance. And we've got two of them. We've got our upper and lower one. I'm going to abbreviate. Zone of intolerance. We're intolerance. We can't survive there. We're there, we die. If we're between our upper and lower bounds, we can survive. We're in our zone of tolerance. But you notice that our population sizes are larger at certain temperature ranges. So, Shelford went further to say, okay, well, we've got maybe an optimal zone. And that's our range where our organism does the best. Might have the fewest costs associated with survival. Between our optimal zone and the zone of intolerance, we have our stress zones. Our organism can survive, but they're not optimal. Our organism can survive, but it's not optimal. And we, have, we think of this concept as helping us to explain why organisms exist where they do. In some cases, it's due to this. The physical factors in the abiotic world might be such where their the organism is in a zone of intolerance and it just can't survive. Other times, you see populations like really big in one area, perhaps that's the optimal zone. And then in another area that looks very similar, <coughs> We don't see a whole lot of individuals. They survive, they can reproduce, but maybe they're in our stress zone. This whole idea here is to explain that no organism can live everywhere. They've got upper and lower bounds that are organisms where our organism can survive. All right? All right, we're going to end here. Our last answer to that attendance quiz is LON, L-O-N. I think I just said names. What names are the correct answers? I already gave you one earlier today. Second one is LON. Yes. Hold on. Yep, yes. Yep, full, yeah, full name. I guess I abbreviated. I don't know why I did that. It's kind of what I put on my answer sheet today, or yesterday when I made it. So, I kind of gave it away. All right. What we'll do is we'll pick up here. Uh, I'll get the quiz out. You'll have until the end of the day on, on Friday to do it. Um, make sure you review. All right.